Hello, everyone. Uh, so my name is Brian Pierce. Um, just before I started my just before I start my talk, I just wanted to give a quick shout out to Val, who seems to have disappeared. Oh, there she is. Um, yeah, it's, it's been great. Like um, I, this is my first demo party, uh, and it's been a great experience. Val, you know, uh, ma managed to arrange my trip here all the way from Toronto, Canada, uh, and, and it's been great. She hosted me, and it's awesome. So thank you, Val. Bless you. Yeah. Uh, yeah, so I just want to introduce myself really, qu really quickly. Uh, as I said, I'm Brian Pierce. Um, I'm a coder, hacker. Um, I've been coding as a kid since since I've been a kid. Always interested in science and tech. Always curious about the way things work. And when I'm not when I'm not coding, I'm usually hacking on some hardware project. Uh, for example, uh, I built this treadmill thing that which controls the speed of your internet connection uh, as you run. <laughs> which was fun. Uh, um, it, professionally, though, I'm, I'm a web developer uh, by trade, uh, so I have a background in, in developing on the web, uh, with JavaScript, HTML, and CSS, and so forth, uh, Python, whatever. And uh, yeah, this is kind of where I fell in love with JavaScript and uh, open source in general. Um, and more recently, in the last few years, I've been interested in VR and uh, uh, this new generation of devices that have, that have popped up. Uh, I was just curious about, you know, the kind of the crowd we have. How many of you have tried the uh, Oculus Rift, for example? Wow, quite a bit of you. Okay. Uh, what about the DK2 specifically, the latest development kit? All right, not too bad. Cool. Okay, so it's it's good crowd for VR. Uh, I'm gonna blaze through just a brief history, just so to give you some context about. Uh, where we've been with VR and where we are. Uh, I guess Jeff can correct me if I get any of this wrong, but... Uh, oh, I, I should also mention that, uh, you know, during my, my, my experiments with VR, I actually managed to join a VR company, which is uh, based in California, and they're working on, like, a, a social platform for VR, so we're hiring. Just any, if, if anyone's interested, let me know, and I'll give you the contact details. Uh, yeah, so the history of VR, you know, uh, some, like at least the public thinks it was a fad. Uh, uh, it kind of started back in the, uh, in the 80s, and it's been a staple of science, fi uh, science fiction for, for decades, uh, with, you know, the classics like uh, Neuromancer and Snow Crasher, uh, Snow, Snow Crash and the Matrix uh, trilogy. Um, you might not know that VR was actually attempted back in the, in the 80s, or, you know, from the 70s to the 90s. People actually tried to do research on this, and companies actually pr tried to produce devices. Uh, but it, it, it failed pretty hard because um, the devices were slow and, and expensive and low performance, and they were heavy. You actually had to suspend these things uh, from the ceiling in order to actually wear them. Um, and the, it, it, VR died a pretty quick death, uh, and it kind of, this is one of the nails in the coffin. It was a terrible VR movie uh, starring Pierce Brosnan about this lawnmower man who got super intelligent inside VR, but it's, it's stupid. Uh, so it, it died really quickly, and, uh, and it basically lay dormant for, for 20 years. Uh, that is, until 2012, uh, when basically a, a teenager, in his garage was obsessed with these VR devices and he had been duct, ta duct taping um, these headsets together on his own. And he just happened to get the attention of John Carmack, the legendary uh, games programmer. And shortly after, they, they, um, they formed a company and they, they started a Kickstarter campaign that actually managed to raise $2.4 million uh, in a matter of a month or something. Um, and this kind of kick-started this new generation uh, and reignited this new generation of, of VR, uh, which we're kind of in the midst of right now. Um, only two years after the Kickstarter, the company was acquired by, by Facebook for $2 billion. Uh, so there's a lot of money going into this field right now, which is pretty exciting. Um, and since then, a bunch of companies, big tech giants have announced their interest in VR, including uh, Microsoft, Google, uh, Valve is actually partnering, partnering with HTC to pr uh, produce a headset called the Vive, uh, which is interesting because it, it, uh, they've developed an entirely new tracking system uh, 
uh, to track both the headset and these controllers um, in, in very precise and uh, very fast way. So that that's pretty, you know, groundbreaking in terms of the types of experiences you can build with that. Um, so there's a bunch of consumer, uh, so so far it's, it's mainly been a development kind of thing. Uh, there are a bunch of uh, development kits like this one uh, available and uh, people have been, you know, spending uh, at least a couple of years um, working on, on uh, software and games for, for, this, for these devices. But uh, a bunch of uh, consumer devices are meant to hit shelves around the end of this year. Um, you can see some of them here. We've got the Oculus Rift, which started all of this over here. Uh, we've got the HTC Vive. Uh, we've got a Samsung Gear VR, which is a mobile phone-based uh, VR device. And we've also got the, uh, mo uh, the Microsoft HoloLens, which is an interesting device in that it's not really VR, it's actually AR, um, augmented reality. And uh, they kind of came out of left field with that. Apparently they had been working on that for, for years in their research labs. Uh, but yeah, that's that's very uh, that's absolutely like it's an interesting avenue for building uh, these these kind of alternate reality apps. Um, uh, so the thing about talking about VR, giving talks about VR, it's 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 a bit difficult because it, VR is is an indescribable experience, right? It's 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 hard to you know. Uh, come across in words what it feels like to put on a headset and experience uh, these these applications. Uh, a VR filmmaker named Chris Milk recently said, "Talking about VR is like uh, dancing about arch architecture. Um, it, it, you can't really, you know, uh, put it in words, and it's, it's something you really have to put a headset on and spend time in to to grok and understand its potential." Um, as you can see, the devices themselves don't look very spectacular. They're basically just plastic boxes that you put on your face. Um, but it's really about the the actual software and and uh, the quality of the device and the uh, the quality of the tracking sensors and so forth, the, the display. Um, so it's everything inside the device that matters uh, more than the, what it looks like when you're putting it on, for example. Um, and because of this new generation of, of devices, you've, you, we're taking advantage of mobile phone hardware, of la the latest GPUs, uh, advanced optics, and that basically puts us above, just above the threshold that that makes VR believable. Um, and you know, it's something that we weren't able to hit back in the in the 80s uh, with the hardware of the time. And what it does basically, it, it fools your brain into thinking that you're actually inside the space in a way that we really haven't been able to do with existing uh, display devices or, or hardware. Uh, you know, we've got 3D monitors which you can use with stereoscopic glasses, but um, even those, they, they might at, at the very least give you a sense of scale, um, or at the most give you a sense of scale, but uh, they don't really put you inside the world that you're viewing. And uh, that's what the goal of these devices are, uh, to actually make you feel like you're inhabiting that world and you have a sense of presence in that world. Um, so, and, and the thing about VR is it's weird in that it's sort of a psychological trick. It doesn't require hyper-realistic graphics to be able to convince someone that they're inside a virtual world. Uh, really, all you have to give them is enough cohesive input from all the tracking sensors, from the display, and so forth. Um, and your brain basically just accepts it as reality. It says, okay, this low polygon, flat shaded world is reality now because I get all the cues that I'd expect from a, uh, from a real world uh, scenario. And finally, VR is really about the software. Uh, once you've got this hardware established and it's it's you know up to spec and it does what you expect it to, um, it's all back to software again. You know it's it's about the experiences that you build, the apps, the emotions, the the, the feeling that you give to your users. Um, so you, you can apply it to. Although most of the applications right now are um, based on you know or applications to uh, to work on games. So uh, the games industry is picking the, this up like crazy. Um, but I, I think that's that's limiting, really, because VR has such a huge potential. Um, it's really a new way to to interact with computers in general, 
and not just a gaming device or peripheral. Um, so you can, you can think about it being used for things like education or simulation or uh, storytelling experiences and so forth. And these, these kind of experiences have been shown on the internet a whole bunch. There's uh, one over here, which is uh, simulating a guillotine um, in VR. So it makes you feel like your head is being chopped off and your head rolls for a few times. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, there's this one here, which is a whole rig that makes you feel like you're a bird flying through the sky with a fan included and everything. <laughs> Um, and there's this one here, which is very interesting. Uh, I think Google bought this company recently. They're actually building a, a, a full, um, basically an environment for artists, artists to draw in 3D. And they've got interesting, you know, like, like full advanced shader technology in there. So you can build really uh, expressive stuff. Um, and again, this takes advantage of uh, controllers. Uh, that, that are included with the HTC Vive and now also with the Oculus uh, uh, Rift device that basically track your hands in space in a, in a, in a size, uh, a space the size of, let's say, five by five by five feet uh, and very precisely and very quickly so you can be very uh, subtle with your movements and capture that in VR. So now that we have this new generation of VR, uh, what is the future going to be like? Uh, I've, I'm betting on the web uh, because that, that seems like the inevitable thing that you know, things are headed in the direction of, of the internet in general. Um, so with that, um, browser, uh, browser vendors have actually started to um, add APIs to, to the browsers to enable VR applications in conjunction with WebGL. <clears throat> um, so, so the Firefox and Chrome teams have actually started working on this already. They've been working on it for almost a year now. And um, there are APIs in the Firefox nightly, build, nightly builds as well as uh, experimental builds of Chrome that allow you to access these VR devices. And uh, in, as I said, in conjunction with uh, WebGL, you can create applications inside a web browser. And at first, it might not sound interesting because web browsers are not notoriously uh, target the you know, lowest common de denominator in terms of graphics and, uh, and fidelity and so forth. And things are trying, uh, starting to change. I, I think the browser vendors have realized that VR requires a, a whole new level of performance in that typically browsers are locked to 60 frames per second, for example. But VR requires now at least 75 per, uh, frames per second at the next generation of, or the generation, generation of devices that are coming out uh, for the consumers will require at least 90 frames per second, for example. So browsers are going to have to catch up, but I think that's going to happen pretty quickly. And um, it's already usable in, 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 uh, in browsers, so uh, I think it's, it's an interesting um, avenue of building apps because Browsers are inherently sort of low barrier uh, to entry. Uh, anyone with a text editor and a browser can, can, access, uh, now, can now access these VR APIs and start building applications. And also, it, uh, browsers are inherently, inherently make uh, content easy to share. So, um, thank you. Uh, it, sharing an application, a VR application, is as, is as easy as sharing a link um, uh, to your friend. Uh, one thing, uh, another point about boring tech is that uh, it's a bit, a bit counterintuitive, but when tech becomes boring, it actually becomes interesting in a way. If you think about Twitter, for example, it wasn't until a billion people had um, uh, cell phones uh, in their hands, you know, dumb phones that accepted calls and text messages. <laughs> But that enabled them to build an app that allows you to send 140 characters to thousands of people across the world. So it's, even though it's a bit counterintuitive, when, when technology becomes ubiquitous, ubiquitous um, it actually becomes even more interesting because it means that it's in the hands of so many people and it gives you an avenue for spreading a technology or a medium uh, very quickly. And I think VR can I, kind of hijack that uh, ubiquity and, and spread uh, pretty quickly on the web. 
Um, lastly, the VR, uh, or rather, the web is, is an interesting platform when you consider the metaverse. Uh, it already has the infrastructure you would need to build connected worlds, uh, virtual worlds. Um, so even though there are companies out there that are claiming to you know, want to build a metaverse, um, I think it's, it's really only going to be something that happens organically in a platform that has no gatekeepers and uh, allows people to add content to it uh, easily. So it's definitely something to keep an eye on. Uh, so if you add all of this up, um, it, it leads to the project that I've been working on for a while. Um, it's been sort of a side project. Uh, it's something I you know, work on uh, on weekends and whenever I get some time. Um, but I've been interested in the more practical uses of VR. Like I said, most of the applications right now are games and in entertainment, but um, I think there's a lot more potential to it. So, so I built an application uh, called Rift Sketch, which allow, allows you to uh, basically code inside VR. Um, so you're basically presented with a barren world in front of you and a text editor, and you can type JavaScript in the text editor, and um, the code is executed as you, as you um, type code, and, and basically that builds the world around you. So part of my motivation for this was I really want to be able to use VR eventually, uh, you know, on a daily basis as part of my, my day job, really. Um, it would be awesome to have this virtual workspace uh, available to me, basically, that, you know, something that I'd be able to essentially snap a monitor into existence, a virtual monitor, whenever, whenever I wanted to, or I'd be able to modify my workspace uh, to my desire you know, add tools to it and uh, modify it to the task that I'm working on at that very moment. Uh, so I think that's, that's a powerful use case, uh, even if you ignore the entertainment side of things. Um, the second part of it was that um, I had been inspired by a person called Brett Victor. Uh, now, Brett Victor is a UX designer. He's worked for Apple in the past, and he's, he's, he's an amazing guy. Like, you should watch some of his talks. Um, one particular talk he gave was about inventing on principle. Um, so he, he basically stated that uh, creators ought to invent based uh, or invent or create based on a single principle that guides them. And his principle was uh, creators ought to have direct uh, direct connection to the creation that they're working on um, and be able to modify it and manipulate it in the the most direct way possible. So he actually demoed uh, uh, an interactive coding environment that kind of blew people's minds. Like, the technology itself wasn't new, but people had gotten so used to coding in IDEs and, and doing things you know, the conventional way um, that he sort of harkened back to the days of, of Engelbart and you know, the people who sort of built this new this computing industry that we all rely on. And uh, you know, basically said that People used to dream about things, about computers taking over the world and you know changing humanity in massive ways. And we've kind of lost that momentum. And all we do right now is sell ads and sell apps. And it's not as fun as it used to be. Uh, so you should definitely uh, you know check Brett and Victor out. One of his latest talks, I just wanted to mention, is that you know he kind of lives about 40 years in the future, it seems, because he's already giving talks about. Um, how best to use programmable matter, for example. Uh, so he's totally out there, but he's awesome. Um, so, so part of that was that you know I wanted to be able to experience this in VR, to be able to create in VR in a direct way, and um, you know have that that tight feedback loop, so that I can I can you know play around in VR without having to take my headset off, for example, or have to wait for a compile uh, cycle. Uh, the other thing was that I think most, programmer, most programmers, although they might not admit it, um, are secretly on a power trip. Uh, I mean, we have access to these incredible machines with billions of transistors, and they're running at billions of operations per second, and they're connected to billions of other computers on the net. And we have control of them through the most direct way. Uh, now, if you think about the fact that VR makes this digital world reality, it means that we'd be able to modify reality in the most powerful way through code, uh, which was an interesting concept to me. And I think it was very compelling, and it, it kind of drove me to, to work on this. 
So I worked on Resketch. I built this environment. It was really simple, actually, in, in JavaScript. It was about, uh, I used uh, a 3.js library, which was uh, basically a, an extraction, extraction, abstraction on top of uh, WebGL, which makes things a bit easier. Um, and the, you know, the first version of the application ended up being about, I don't know, 500, 1,000 lines of code. It was really simple. Uh, and I released it on the web, not thinking much about it, posted a video on YouTube. And you know, a few weeks later, it, it took off like crazy. Um, at, at this point, it's at about 190,000 views, which is insane. Uh, it got posted on The Verge uh, news site. And Neil Stephenson actually shared it on, on Facebook, which blew my mind. Um, but yeah, that's, that's where I am right now. I've kind of been launched into this virtual reality uh, field, uh, not, off, not entirely off my own volition, but it's been, it's been a wild ride. Uh, yeah, so that's, that's all I had to talk about. I'll just spend a few minutes giving you a demo of what it's like to actually try this out. Sorry, I have to deal with like three monitors here. Just restart that. Um, maybe I can describe the the hardware while I'm setting up. So we've got the DK2 here. Uh, the interesting thing about it is that it's got uh, internal LEDs sort of embedded in the frame, uh, which are used by the infrared camera here to track track its position in space. I've also got a leap motion hand tracking device attached to the front of it, um, which allows you to track your hands in 3D space as well. All right, so it looks like I have this working, hopefully. All right. When I um, when I put this into to Oculus or VR mode, you're going to see two a uh, split screen basically. What you see inside the display is that uh, you have a a view for each eye, and I've got some code here uh, in these three panels, and basically an empty world otherwise. And I've got my hands in VR. What I can do, one of the things I implemented is the ability to move these editors around so I can position them wherever is uh, convenient. Uh, so I've got some code here um, that actually implements a 
flocking algorithm. But before I get into that, I'm just going to see. I'm just going to uh, show you a simple example of what it feels like to sort of edit in this world. So I've, you've got, uh, I've got your basic 3GS setup here. Uh, we've got a scene and a light, and uh, you can ignore the rest of that code for now. Uh, but what I can do here is add a cube to the scene, for example. So, uh, can you... oh, sure, sorry. Is that better? Okay, cool. Okay, so I'm just going to uh, create a new cube here. And this is a bit complicated in 3JS, but uh, just give me a sec here. So, mesh. I should really just write a helper function for this. Uh, let's see. And um, we need a material as well. Let's use a basic material. And as you can see, I'm kind of touch typing here. Um, in one of the earlier versions of the software, I lost this feature recently. Uh, I actually had the ability to project a webcam, disp or, or webcam image back into VR so I could see my hands and the keyboard, uh, but I have yet to add that back. Uh, so hopefully, cube should appear somewhere. Oh, wait, I haven't added it to the scene yet. Let's do that. Uh, Scene.add. Cube. Oh, it appears to be in front of my face. <laughs> All right, let's move that outside. Set, uh, let's say 1.11. One one one. Oh, that doesn't help. Let's say, increase that number by 10. Yeah, I would not recommend typing blind. Hopefully, most of you are still in the room. <laughs> uh, what am I doing wrong here? Your dreams are about to be realized. Getting this wrong. Is the cube is massive? I don't understand. <laughs> All right, this is not a good idea. <laughs> yeah. Sorry, I'm trying to debug on the fly here. Do -do -do -do. Oh, I see what I'm doing wrong. You're not supposed to do that at all. Sorry. I'm a bit rusty with my code. And I've lost my cursor. There we go. I know I'm cutting into question time, but I'll try to keep this short. Yay. <laughs> All right, there's a cube somewhere in the world. <laughs> it's probably outside the skybox or something. Really? 
the cube? Where are you? Oh, there it is. I see you. All right, let's, let's uh, mess around with this cube. So uh, one of the interesting things in VR is really the sense of scale. Uh, so this cube is, is pretty far away from me right now. Uh, so I'll bring it a bit closer. Oh, where'd it go? There it is. Oh. All right, so it's, a, it's about a meter by a meter by a meter. Uh, one thing I can do is, is increase its size. So let's do that. Uh, let's say 10. And to you, it looks like just a two dimensional uh, thing on the screen, but to me, it looks like a 10 meter tall cube, which is interesting. And uh, I can increase that a bit more. Uh, that feels weird. <laughs> But yeah, uh, the sense of scale is, is quite astonishing. And hopefully some of you actually get to try this out. Oh, that was loud. Actually get to try this out at some point. Um, uh, I'll try to set up a demo. Uh, in addition to Rift Sketch, which is a bit hard to use, so maybe not this one. But uh, there's actually a, a nice demo scene, uh, or rather a, demo, a VR demo created by a demo scene uh, person, um, which is interesting. So I'll try to set that up instead for people who are not proficient in JavaScript. Uh, so the other thing you can do in here is, uh, is animate things. So one thing I can do is I've got a um, function here that is returned from the context, and I can do something like q.position.setx uh, to j, for example. That doesn't do much right now, but if I create a variable called j, and then increment it in the loop function. Oops, and it kind of takes off into infinity. Or just moves slowly by. And it's always fun to add sign functions and so forth, so. Um, so let's get into the, the rest of the code we have here. This is kind of boring. Uh, the other thing I've prepared in advance is uh, some flocking, uh, is a flocking algorithm. So I've got this code for generating voids in the world. So let me just increase the number of voids here to 10. And that these creates these, uh, these little triangle things that uh, the other thing I wanted to mention is that I can actually move around because it's tracked in space. So I can, I can actually just get up and walk around these things, look at them from different angles, which is fun. Um, and that's not something you can do on a, on a, you know, a stereoscopic uh, 2D display. Uh, so let's, let's actually give, some of, give these boys some behavior. Uh, let's see. Uh, right now they're just static, so I will just enable their move behavior or give them a velocity here. They start moving away. They've already got a flocking algorithm in implemented, so they avoid each other and align to each other. Um, and they actually return to the origin uh, if they get too far away from the source. I'm moving a bit too fast. Oops. Oops. And uh, one thing I can do is because I've got my hands in VR, is that I can actually uh, have these voids interact with my hands a bit. Oops. And the way I can do that is um, add, a, add one more uh, behavior to the voids. And I'll do that by copying some in this existing code. Do, do, do. Not. Oh, 
let's call it uh, hands or something. And um, let's see, let's set of this stuff. I want to uh, get a hand out of the scene. Hand one. And if there's no hand, just return. good to me. And I can just enable that behavior here. Oops. What's it called? Hands? That's not going to work. Okay, so hopefully that does something. All right, that is not going to work out. <laughs> hmm. I might have to cheat a bit and look at the code that I had in place. All right. You can see that the voids are attracted to my hand or not. <laughs> there you go. Make the uh, slurp a bit stronger. Uh, there's a performance problem here <laughs> that I haven't worked out yet, but you get the idea. All right, that was the end of my demo. Sorry for going long. But if anyone has any questions, we have about three minutes left. Thank you. Oh, the, the editor are, uh, so the editor is actually backed by an HTML input, input uh, text box, uh, but I re-rendered the text in 3.js uh, because there's no way to combine HTML and CSS and, and WebGL at the moment, but uh, Mozilla is actually working on making that happen, so that might happen in the next uh, year or so. It would be cool. Other questions? Right. Yeah, good point. Um, one thing I didn't show you is that I actually do have a gesture sort of enabled where you can basically put your hands together, make a make a, a sign with with your hands, and then move them back and forth to able to be able to ma manipulate a number. So that's one way of doing it. Uh, 
a slider would work just as well, but since you have you know gesture capability, I think that's one way, another way of uh, accomplishing the same thing. Questions? Oh, uh, one thing I forgot to mention is that I also have this device, which is Google Cardboard. Uh, it's basically a cheaper version of VR uh, that is you know about twenty bucks to to buy online as opposed to something which is about uh, 350 bucks right now. Um, obviously, the experience is not as great, but it means that a lot more people can experience VR just by sliding their phone into one of these. Uh, so if you're interested, I actually have about a half dozen of these to give away, if anyone's interested. Um, I also have resources for being able to develop in web, web VR. Uh, if anyone's interested, you can come talk to me afterwards. Uh, as I mentioned, Altspace, my company is hiring, so if you're interested in that, let me know. All right, I think I'm done. Thank you.